Well, let's get across the market open now. Scott Phillips joining us from The Motley Fool. Scott, good to catch up with you again as we round out this week uh, on a very positive note, of course, because we've seen markets both here and in the US hit new record highs. Andrew, good day. Yeah, it's been a really good week, hasn't it? Uh, three out of the last four days in positive territory. Wall Street pretty flat overnight. Uh, our market wasn't expected to come up with a great lead, so maybe we might make it three out of five. But either way, pretty positive, as you say, in general, and fresh market highs. Worth noting, mate, uh, we've heard the phrase, the, the most hated bull market in history a lot. I don't know what's that. This is probably the most ignored bull market in history, largely because a lot of investors don't have the spare cash because of interest rates and inflation. But uh, I don't remember the last time there was less fuss made, particularly in the popular media, about market highs. It's very, very hard to find any mention of it. There's no sense among the broader population and even many investors there's much to be excited about at all. And yet, as you say, we're hitting here at home and, of course, in the US as well. All right. So I guess the question is, what next then, uh, Scott? <laughs> uh, obviously, given, well, globally at least, the easing cycle yeah. is underway. Uh, mind you, you take a look locally. Any prospect mm -hmm. of a rate cut here now even further out, particularly off the back of those jobs numbers yesterday? Seems like it, doesn't it, mate? We'll start with the jobs numbers, if that's OK. Yeah, 4.1%. Like, here's the problem. I've said many times, I'll say many more times, I'm sure, before we genuinely get through uh, into a, a meaningful rate cut cycle. Um, it, it, it is good news is bad, bad news is good, as always, right? 64,000 jobs created. I mean, 64,000 Australians can pay the rent, pay the mortgage. Unemployment rate remains low. Participation rate kicked up again. Uh, this is an economy that, from a consumer perspective, you know, now the consumer confidence is, is GFC levels of pessimism, and yet businesses are hiring and hiring and hiring. And it's, on one hand, hard to square the circle. Plenty of people have got jobs. Uh, the economy's okay. The challenge, of course, as we know, is the fact that at the household budget level, really hard to find an extra dollar between, as I said, that inflation and rates challenge. Um, that's a double prong, double whammy, really. And it's, it's very, very hard to get out from under. So that's kind of the good news on, on unemployment. The bad news, of course, from a, from a markets perspective, from an economy perspective, is the RBA is looking to see an economy that's not growing so robustly. Employment's not growing so robustly. People sort of say, oh, they want people to lose jobs. It's a, it's a bit of a tabloid shortcut. Um, what they're saying is when the labour market is this strong, it's hard to believe the, these inflationary pressures are going away anytime soon. And that's why it's so difficult. The one bright shining light you've already mentioned, mate, is not only the rate cutting cycle internationally, but the inflation numbers. 2.5% in the US, 1.7% in the UK. New Zealand's come down as well, though their economy's in more trouble than Superman. It, it's, it's a really... You know, to whatever extent we have imported inflation continuing to impact our economy, and we know it's meaningful, that should be bringing down the rate of inflation, not prices, of course, but the rate of inflation should be coming down when it comes to our trade exposed industries. That should be good news for the economy. And the rates decision is really difficult, mate. Look, the RBA has been very strong. Michelle Bullock, very clear. It's underlying inflation. It's within the target band. It's close to halfway between 2 and 3%. In other words, 2.5. And we're at 3.4 now. What the RBA will be doing, though, is trying to work out how quickly does this come down from here? And that's kind of going to, going to be what matters, mate. I suspect the, the, the best odds are on a rate cut early next year, Feb, March, something like that. Um, but, they, you know, don't, don't rule out the fact they either change their mind or simply recognise the pain they're causing people and say, well, close enough is good enough. We're getting there. Internationally, it's coming down. We'll follow soon enough. Let's assume that's true and let's just cut rates now. So that would be the rate cut pace later this year. Very likely, I think, though, still is a rate cut next year, unless the RBA really changes its tune and its thinking quite significantly. Yeah, in fact, uh, and we had the European Central Bank cutting rates again last night as well. Exactly. So, yeah, the RBA mm -hmm. looking very much like an outlier at this point. Uh, yep. Scott, let's, uh, let's get uh, stock specific. Uh, mm -hmm. The biggest movie yesterday was uh, Star Entertainment. Uh, mm -hmm. Went into a trading yeah. halt. This is off the back of a decision by the regulator in New South Wales. It's had a bit of a reprieve, hasn't it? Uh, look, its licence remains suspended and look, really wrapped over the knuckles with a $15 million fine. Mate, so it, well, I'll get stock to you a second. Let me get policy specific first. It's a Mickey Mouse penalty, mate. $15 million. CBA was charged $7.5 million fine yesterday for sending some emails without an unsubscribe link at the bottom. Star has been guilty of everything it's been found guilty of twice and it gets a $15 million fine, barely doubled that that CBA paid for sending some dodgy emails. Um, it, it, I, I don't know. The, the, the commission was very clear. It's about the jobs, it's about the economy, about everything other than star. Uh, it, is, it is a protected species. It's clearly too big to fail. Uh, that, that's, that's the only way you can look at this one. I don't know what star has to do to lose its license from here, mate. If, if what they've done is not enough, 
I don't know what you would, I genuinely don't know what you have to do to lose a license, uh, which makes it a protective species. That's why the share price jumped yesterday. Um, uh, they've still got some financial worries, by the way. It still could go broke regardless. Uh, but remember, this, they could have been fined $100 million. The commission chose to fine them $15 million instead. Uh, Policy-wise, we should be, frankly, very dis disturbed by what happened. Your star shareholder, by the way, you had a very good day yesterday. Um, you know, there were some conversations around, you know, what's it worth if it does keep its license, if it can get its house in order. We get to find out now. Uh, still some massive issues, massive cash flow issues. The bank is still very tightly controlling what's happening there. Uh, but it's got a lease of life. I, I think it's untouchable from a regulatory perspective from now. Um, it just remains to be seen whether it can get itself out from under that debt pile, get its operations back in order and, and get growth again. Speaking of stocks on the outer, AMP, it also had a very good day yesterday. <laughs> exactly. uh, seeing yeah. some good inflows at the moment. How would you see that, that company? Yeah. Oh, mate. I mean, hope springs eternal, right? I've said many times, 40 years ago, it, you know, there was a couple of companies in Australia. One was called the AMP. The other was the BHP. And when you put a V in front of it, it kind of gives you that sense of, of how it was seen. Now, these were, these were big, big multinational or, or massively national businesses. AMP was the biggest national name in finance. This is before any of the banks. You know, Westpac was the Bank of New South Wales. Commonwealth Bank was owned by the government. Uh, you know, these were um, the AMP was, should have been the biggest name in finance right now. And it's just spent 40 years falling over its own feet. And then you kind of go, maybe finally it's turned the corner. Maybe this time it's different. Uh, I hope for AMP shareholders, speaking of long-suffering shareholders, I hope they get something out of this. I hope AMP can right the ship. Uh, I hope it has finally been able to rule a line under what's been a terrible business model for the best part of those, at least the last 20 years, probably the last 30 or 40. Um, so I, I, having been burnt more than once with AMP, you'd want to see some sustained recovery. You don't have to jump in at the very, very low point or try and pick the bottom. Uh, but it is good news, unquestionably. Shareholders liking it. Uh, less bad than was expected might be a better better number than than actually really positive. Mm. But the fact that it's getting some inflows again all of a sudden does suggest investors are prepared to look, that is fund investors, not, not shareholders, are prepared to look at AMP's funds. And that should be good news because these things tend to move in, in cycles. But once you start getting some inflows, it's possible, maybe even probable you start to get some more. And that could be good news for AMP and for its share price. Scott, just a final thought. Um, obviously, a lot of focus on China at the moment with a stimulus and whether it's going to continue yeah. to come through with that. How are you feeling about those, those China proxy stocks, particularly uh, the iron ore miners? So I should say I own Fortescue shares, Andrew, as you listen to probably your viewers, so I probably know. Um, I, I, I think long term, these guys are fine. We have low cost producers, particularly the big three. Uh, you throw in Bale as well, but realistically, that's kind of where they're at. They're in a pretty good position. The iron ore price has been a bit weaker recently, as we all know, on some concerns about that, although it's bounced again once the Chinese stimulus came out. Longer term, I feel very good about Fortescue particularly. Um, I, I don't mind any other miners either, by the way, but I think they're in a good place. I don't think we should suspect we can get ultra high prices forever. And we're kind of seeing that the share prices, right? The share prices kind of reflect the fact that markets expecting the iron ore price is not as strong ongoing but still well and surely high enough to make some money for these guys. Should be pretty good value for most investors most of the time. Uh, there will be always be uncertainty around Chinese stimulus, around what's happening in China in general, Chinese demand more specifically. The big watch out for me is not so much the waves of Chinese demand, mate. It's alternative op options. The Chinese are desperately trying to find oil in Africa uh, until they can offset what's effectively, a, from their perspective, a cartel. It's not exactly working as a cartel, but there's four big players. They're setting the price. They're, they're setting the volumes. Um, if China can find alternative supply, I'd be worried. In the meantime, cyclical China stimulus and uh, uh, you know growth and decline. <clears throat> Excuse me, not something I'm particularly worried about. I have to say.